Hello, everyone. For all of you who have just joined us and have um, not been part of this conference, which is now in its fourth day, welcome to the seventh session of Democratic Socialism and Global Perspective. This is an international conference organized by the Transnational Institute and the Havens Wright Center for Social Justice. My name is Patrick Barrett. I am the managing director of the Havens Wright Center, and I'll be facilitating this session. Um, I would like to give a really big thank to the translators themselves, um, Lala, Isabel, and Liz, for providing translation throughout the conference and making it possible for more people to participate. Um, this session is titled Left Populism and Democratic Socialism, a new kind of politics, a new type of party. I'm really excited by the group of people that we've brought together for this panel. I'll introduce each speaker in more detail before they speak, but for now, I do wanna mention quickly who they are and welcome them to this discussion. They are Constanza Moreira from Uruguay, James Foley and Pete Remand from Scotland, Daniel Obono from France, and Paolo Gerbado from Italy. Before providing a fuller introduction of each of these speakers, I'd like to go over the format just a bit. Um, each panelist will be given approximately 20 minutes, after which we will have about 30 minutes or so for an open exchange. You can share your questions throughout the session via the Q&A button in the Zoom panel, again, at the bottom of your screen. And there's also, you can see a chat function and you can feel free to send messages there. Although if you have questions or comments, we ask you to put them in the Q&A um, function. So um, I will also invite questions and contributions from other conference panelists. That is to say, people who have spoken or will be speaking during other parts of the conference. So I ask you all to be prepared when the panelists have finished, finished speaking uh, so that we can then seamlessly get into our Q&A uh, portion. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Constanza Moreira. Constanza is an academic scholar, writer, and politician, a former Senator in the Uruguayan parliament between 2010 and 2020 and the founder and main leader of Casa Grande, or Big House, uh, one of the political organizations that composed the left coalition Frente Amplio, or Broad Front. She was a presidential candidate for the Broad Front in the 2014 primary elections. She has authored several books and is a professor of political science at the University of the Republic in Montevideo. Constanza, I turn it over to you. Um... Hello, everybody. I will speak in Spanish, but slowly. Buenos días, voy a hablar en español. Y es un placer enorme. It is a great pleasure to be in this conference. Y formar parte del panel con un título tan sugestivo como with such a suggestive title as leftist populism democrático, partidos del nuevo democratic socialism, una nueva política, a new politics. Bueno, mi exposición se basa en los aprendizajes de lo que llamamos la década larga de la década de la década progressive oh, uh, leftism in Latin America, or as García Linera was called it, the golden age Latina, of Latin America, comienza, which con began el de en with 1998, the triumph of Chávez in 1998, was followed with the triumph of Lula in 2002, in of Kirchner in Argentina in 2003, Uruguay, in 2004, of the Frente Amplio in Uruguay in 2004, and of Evo Morales and Correo starting in 2006. That long cycle, the golden decade, the long decade of se ve Latin truncada, básicamente, o la vemos como truncada, we see as shortened or truncated a with a conservative Macri, cycle, starting with Macri's victory in 2015 and with the destitution of Dilma in 2016. The coup d'etat in the parliament marked a before and after for this political cycle in Latin America. Populism, progressism, leftist, leftist government, or change, 
rosa the pink eh, tide. Yo creo que es, es una discusión I think hasta cierto punto categorial that this is a categorical discussion I am a politician eh, and an academic que, eh, los de definición that the de problems of definition of movements and parties has been more categorical than political. Populism or left populism. I refuse to believe that the experiences of Latin America can be categorized under this title because they are so diverse. Beyond seeing that on this panel there are papers and interesting contributions. Um, Hubo partidos de izquierda, There were left claramente, parties, Frente Amplio, clearly, Frente Amplio, Brasil, the Workers' Party, Pepe in Brazil, en, eh, Bolivia. Or the Hubo líderes de izquierda que crearon Bolivia. partidos, There como Evo mo Morales, movements that created como, parties, such as Evo Morales or Chavez. Y hubo gobiernos que fueron de izquierda, más allá de que las coaliciones o los partidos que lo representaban eh, abarcaban mucho del espectro included much of the political spectrum. No one can say that the Peronism is just left. There is right-wing Peronism and left Peronism that the Kirchners can be considered within the cycle of the left. For this, I tend to assume a positional criteria of ideology, that is to say, from the left, as opposed to the right. And really, in, in all of these governments were opposed to the right, including the concertation in no Chile, which is not used much in the America. analyses on progressive governments campo, in Latin America. This field, campo político, this political field y derecha, of es un left and right, is a system of forces that defines public policy, that defines the international position of these governments, and which defines things like the election of the vaccine, the Russian one, or the uh, European or US one. These governments, leftist populist governments, carried out four Common policies of what I call the practical decir, library. That is to say, there is a library that was constructed in practice with certain independence of a more robust theory to sustain. In, in this practical library of progressivism, on the one hand, it's the recuperation of the state. On this table, panel we have Europeans and Latin America, and I would say the division between market and state is ideological. And which is determinant in positioning the left and right. This has to do with the recuperation of public assets, be it oil, the stabilization of potable water in Uruguay, or the statization, nationalization of other industries in Argentina. So everywhere we see a recuperation of the state, of the totality of the state, of public spending, and so on. Secondly, they are characterized in politics based in work policies, um, on income, workers' rights, and the emphasis on different governments, and which reached even tax reform that were progressive. In third place, place these governments implemented a politics of recognition of rights, America which was very important in Latin America, de derechos de las mujeres, of women's de rights, de los afrodescendientes, of afrodescendant rights, sobre todo de las poblaciones indígenas, and y el caso boliviano of indigenous rights, político. and the Bolivian case is eh, exemplary here. Y en lugar, una in fourth place, they had an international policy which coincided and which led to the creation of institutions such as and to the recuperation of this broad notion of Latin America, which is very central to notions of the left. What is the left of democratic socialism? I'm going to give three characteristics. The first is the abandonment of no fue toda armada, The leftist of the 60s uh, was pero la not only armed, cubana, but the Cuban Revolution did give a certain tone to the Latin American left. 
And there were guerrilla movements in good part of the continent. These guerrilla movements, these parties and leaders were reconverted to the democratic process. I mentioned three examples, Mujica in Uruguay, which then formed the Frente Amplio Party, which was very successful. Dilma, who was imprisoned and tortured for belonging to the armed left, and Kirchner, with, who had sympathies with the Montoneros, an armed movement in Argentina. So the abandonment of the armed struggle and then insertion into the political sphere is a characteristic of this wave. Fueron innovadoras, super they were innovadoras, innovative, momento, very innovative. El kirchnerismo intentó the kirchnerism la de la tried the transversalization of the left. Uh, el más the mass, eh, la they developed the policy, an indigenous policy, al, uh, al and a plurinationalism of highlighting indigenous struggles. And even Chavez was very innovative with his Las socialism in the 21st century. The identitary characteristics of these left, de the new eh, symbols of this de los gobiernos, del ciclo de of the government of this progressive eh, cycle in Latin America, de, de, su recuperación del rol del Estado, su Beyond the recuperation laborales, of the role of the state, eh, workers' rights, fueron el antipatriarcado y la decolonización. Patriarchalism and decolonization. Many of these left declared themselves anti-patriarchal, including the Frente Amplio. But the struggle si against patriarchy was relatively new if y compared with the of the 60s, and the decolonization, not just as a theoretical proposal, but as a praxis. This wasn't present in the agendas of the left of the 60s. And then there were a few incorporations that didn't work out so well. That had to do with the proposal for buen vivir, for good living, to generate a style of development that was kinder to nature and community, and to discuss the development model. And I don't think we've advanced too far on this. And eco, the eco movement who fought with the leftist governments. No terminan de construir. These didn't quite get incorporated into the left. Creo que la región, eh, lo, el ciclo largo de I think that the long cycle of progressive como dije, governments that initiated 2000, in the early 2000s and was truncated in 2015 leaves us with three important deficits, which also need to be incorporated in the The first is that political success was totally dependent on economic success. The long cycle of the commodities boom in Latin America, of the exportation of raw materials, was the underpinning and gave 10 years of good economic growth that we hadn't este seen since the 50s. And this economic growth allowed at least, and I know there's a lot of critiques around this kind of growth model and developmentalism, but without this economic growth, it would have been impossible to implement the social policies around wage and others related to the growth, economic growth, and to having the fiscal space to expand public spending, social spending, in education, in health. It is really impressive particularly in the education levels in Latin America. This dependency on economic success meant that when the economy declined, then so did the leftist government, as the case of Dilma in Brazil suggests. This was connected to the international insertion in the global market of Latin America which was brought about by extractivism. Latin America continues to export raw materials and thus was very vulnerable to economic cycles. 
Estados Unidos, ahora lo hacemos a China, pero lo we exportadores de materia prima. Y yo quiero decir que acá que, que no solamente hay una elección de traición de los gobiernos, de izquierda sobre esto, no sino only of a tradition of leftist government, externos but also there were external constraints crédito, that were very important. The access to credit, externa, the directa, access to external y las reglas del comercio internacional obligaron muchas veces a los gobiernos de izquierda often a tomar for decisiones rígidas con fundamentos decisions. políticos e ideológicos básicos. Not aligned with their political Finalmente, los Finally, gobiernos de izquierda o progresistas o populares, o populares o populistas, fueron altamente dependientes de la opinión pública, porque se ganó con los votos. Opinion. Because they won with the izquierda, the only thing the left fue el poder del Estado, la conquista del the, Estado, the pero no tuvo el poder económico, no tuvo el poder mediático, the political no tuvo el poder financiero. Power. They didn't have the financial eh, power. De hecho, There, las, los constreñimientos fact, financieros a nivel internacional, los tratados de inversión, los tratados de libre comercio, limitaron enormemente el treaties, margen de las políticas públicas que pudieron desarrollar el gobierno, public policies como lo that these governments el caso de la as exemplified de la by the case of the legalization of marijuana in Uruguay. Or policies on coca in Bolivia. Um, estos eh, gobiernos dependieron These entonces de los votos. Su poder fueron los votos. Y con los votos conquistaron los parlamentos, and with votes they conquered parliaments, they did constitutional assemblies, they reformed, but they needed the votes. Y la dependencia de la opinión pública, hay que ver cómo las encuestas de opinión pública se transforman en los votos. And we have to see how polls became, you know, public opinion polls became true political actors. Izquierdas avanzar en los temas de género. Recordemos que América Latina es el continente más católico del mundo. Y ahora, Let's remember that Latin America is the most Catholic country in the world. Y el deseo de no espantar, dirían, a los votantes católicos, a los votantes católicos, católicos evangélicos llevó a the evangelical voters led to desertions in the field of sexual reproductive rights in many places especially in Correa's Ecuador in second place this desire to not scare and this dependency on public opinion led these governments in particular in Uruguay In Brazil, tomaran el tema de la seguridad pública como central, de destinar una enorme cantidad security, de recursos a fortalecer los cuerpos armados y represivos de la policía y de la policía. De Sobre esto, la so izquierda on. tiene un debate pendiente, pero tiene un debate pendiente, pero la izquierda no logró salir del punitivismo represivo eh, que afecta la una de las regiones más violentas del mundo. Así que una de las más violentas de los países de prisioneros per cápita, sin ser años de gobierno de izquierda. Termino diciendo eh, la reacción conservadora, quizá la más emblemática, Maybe the most emblematic of is Bolsonaro, Macri, but also Macri, eh, también es Janine Áñez, en Bolivia, Janine Áñez, en Bolivia, Even eh, though he's not la, la reacción conservadora the reaction, no es solo reacción a la izquierda o es no solo una reacción de to the left, or the product of the Perdón, deficits Constanza. of the left. Sí. Te, queda, te queda aproximadamente cinco minutos. Sí, sí, ya terminé. La reacción conservadora no es solo una reacción a la izquierda reaction y no es solo producto de los deficits de la izquierda. Y no es solo producto de los deficits de la izquierda. El desastre, el desaceleramiento económico contribuyó, pero la polarización ideológica impregna nuestra sociedad. Y yo digo, por suerte, por suerte, y vivimos épocas de polarización política y de polarización económica. Es bueno que vivimos en una época de 
economic ¿Por qué digo por suerte? Porque con raras excepciones, la política conservadora dominó América Latina a lo largo del siglo XX. Y en la Latin America, tercera ola de la democracia, es decir, en la democracia de los últimos 30 años, hay muchos países que ni siquiera han tenido, han pasado por la aventura de tener un gobierno progresista, populistas o mareas rosas. Menciono Guatemala, menciono Perú, Perú. And Colombia. Eh, América Latina eh, Latin America vivió un interregno lived an maravilloso interregno en estos was 15 años, del cual, sobre el cual debemos aprender y and we have a lot to sobre el cual debemos reflexionar, porque and después reflect. de la izquierda armada, la izquierda de gobierno the es la más marcante the left de las biografías de la izquierda is the most significant experience of the left tomó Latin este America. espacio político y ensayó and took up this political space and it experimented many things that need to be understood hoy hay una nueva política de izquierda now we have a new politics of the left hay una nueva política de izquierda marcada eh, por su vínculo con los movimientos populares por el, la descolonización, por el antipatriarcalismo. Y recuerdo las palabras de Monedero And I para decir Monedero's que estas izquierdas latinoamericanas eh, in Latin son partidos y movimientos and y que allí eh, se deben conjugar estas tres almas en particular yo vengo de Uruguay de un partido político que es el alma de la izquierda revolucionaria e insurreccional, el alma de la izquierda revolucionaria y el alma de la izquierda anarquista. Y está muy bien lo que dijo Monedero. Creo que las nuevas izquierdas deben conjugar esto, deben apostar a coaliciones enormes, a acuerdos enormes, has donde to come todos to huge agreements cedan una parte, everybody gives y utilizar a little, la biblioteca práctica and to use de los the años pasados para dar impulso y igualdad. Muchas gracias. Y gra muchas gracias por esa presentación thank tan you, interesante. Thank you for such an um, interesting presentation. Thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. We're going to move now to our next two speakers. And we're going to take a sharp turn geographically, moving very far northeast to Scotland, um, where our two next speakers are from. They're going to give a joint presentation. And let me introduce them in the order that they're going to be speaking. James Foley is the co-author of What is Scottish Independence For? That's a book forthcoming from Verso. And the co-author of Yes, The Radical Case for Scottish Independence. He's currently completing a new book on the politics of sovereignty and the crisis of the European Union to be published next year. He is a member of the Contour Editorial Board and has written for a variety of publications, including The Guardian, Open Democracy, and Socialist Register. Pete Remand is a Scottish political activist and author. He's the author of Yes, the Radical Case for Scottish Independence uh, the, and the co-author of Old Nations, Old Enemies, New Times, The Selected Works of Tom Nairn. He's a, also a member of the Contour Editorial Board and was a founding member of the Radical Independence Campaign in Scotland. He's currently completing a PhD in sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he researches populism, nationalism, and social movements when he isn't organizing conference like this one and working at the Havens Wright Center. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to James. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a couple of points that I think should be fairly uncontroversial. Firstly, that since 2008, we have seen the breakdown of the order of neoliberal globalization and the crisis of legitimacy of its associated political forces. On the other hand, there is nowhere particularly in the global left where we can point to sustained uh, growth in power and influence for the anti-capitalist uh, left. It's in this uh, context that myself and Pete have uh, examined the populist moment and the broader pop uh, problem of populism. Very crudely, it tends to be the case that when people talk about populism, they talk about it as something that other people do, uh, a bad thing, usually, that other people do. Populism tends to be um, a label that is imposed on one's political enemies. And it's in that context that myself and Pete first started considering this when we wrote for Socialist Register 
several years ago, beginning with an examination of the cottage industry in the academic world of populism studies which tended to do this process where it would equate, on the one hand, Bernie Sanders, on the other hand, Donald Trump, on the one hand, Jeremy Corbyn, on the other hand, Jacob Rees-Mogg and the Brexiteers in the United Kingdom, on the one hand, Podemos, and on the other hand, Viktor Orban, and so on and so forth. Um, and we not only wanted to critique that, but also to make a prediction which was to say that increasingly it would be the case that the discredited liberal establishment, the centre ground of politics in the neoliberal era, would try to regain their power and influence in the global north precisely on the negative basis of their opposition to populism. And this, I think, is a prediction that has been essentially borne out. If you look at Kamala Harris and Joe Biden uh, that have just been elected in the United States, or if you look at the restoration mode of Keir Starmer and his leadership of the United Kingdom Labour Party, they have nothing approaching a, um, a, a positive programme um, that they can really defend. On the other hand, they are entirely defining themselves against um, basically uh, populism of the left and right, against, on the one hand, uh, Donald Trump, on the other hand, Bernie Sanders, and so on and so forth. It's in that context, I suppose, that myself and Pete would at the very minimum say that we are anti-anti-populist um, and that we want to explore the possibilities of the populist moment, its anti-establishment, anti-political and so on sentiments, and what role that could have played in the revival of the left, and also uh, what role it might play in future. We also, I think, want to talk about some of the problems of uh, populism, its inherent theoretical weaknesses that I will come on to. Now, there's a couple of things you always need to say when you begin the discussion of populism, which is firstly to say that most political forces do not define themselves as populist. It's not a, that type of label in the sense that, for instance, socialism or even nationalism has been uh, historically. Partial exceptions to that general rule um, are the leftist challengers of Syriza and uh, Podemos, who were explicitly indebted to a, um, to a, a populist methodology for growing their own political power, rooted in the theories particularly of Ernesto Leclerc. Leclerc himself uh, defined populism as being a mode of rhetoric, in theory open to any type of political movement, that defined itself with an antagonistic relationship between, on the one hand, the sovereign people, and on the other hand, the established uh, elite order. Now, it goes without saying that those terms are inherently vague, um, inherently ambiguous, and don't have a great deal of content to them, those terms, uh, the people and the establishment. But for Leclerc and his political uh, supporters, this was more of a feature than a bug. What the populist type of rhetoric uh, solved for these, um, for these theorists was an essential political problem for the left, which is the changing nature of much of the working class, the sociological changes that began to happen in the 60s and 1970s and so on. And in particular, the fact that the old order of the uh, political left rooted in the traditions of the working class and trade unionism had to relate to a host of new challenger social movements, feminism, environmentalism, LGBT politics, and so on and so forth. Now, there's a couple of things to say about that, which is firstly, I think that this continues to be both a, a problem and one of the goals that the left needs to confront today is to be able to articulate together the politics of the working class uh, and the politics of identity of these postmodern social movement challengers and so on and so forth were still in some sense in that moment. And secondly, what I would say as an advantage of the populist mode of rhetoric 
is that it's not just this type of uh, woolly, um, amorphous, rainbow coalition of forces. What it defines is a basically antagonistic relationship between this coalition of forces of the left, or whoever is defining it, um, and the existing mode of politics, the existing state apparatus, the existing corporate elite, and so on and so forth. So it's founded on a basic binary opposition that exists in the structure of society. And in this sense, we see that there is an inherent uh, advantage to the populist type of rhetoric. Now, the main complaint that you will hear from uh, many liberals, uh, centrists, some on the liberal left and so on, is that uh, populism, as it's implied in Lacau's term, the sovereign people, implies an essentially nationalistic mode of framing of political challenges. And what we have seen, of course, is the breakdown of the uh, neoliberal order of globalization has seen uh, a range of grievances against formations such as the European Union, NAFTA, NATO, and so on and so forth. The liberal critique, the anti-populist critique that myself and Pete uh, set out to challenge was essentially that insofar as you oppose the European Union, that you oppose even NAFTA, NATO, uh, TTIP, whatever it happens to be, insofar as you oppose any of the forces of neoliberal globalization, there is a slippery slope that leads from that type of discourse to the discourses of the populist right, and therefore that you shouldn't engage with grievances around the decline and failure of capitalist globalization. And very clearly what we wanted to assert was that we should uh, reject this type of blackmail, that responding to the crisis of globalization is part of the tasks of the left today. We also wanted to assert that these are the traditions of the left, even insofar as we think of leftism as being an internationalist uh, type of challenge to mainstream nationalism. If you go back and read for instance, the Communist Manifesto uh, by Karl Marx, as I'm sure you all have. Um, you will, of course, read that the workers of the world have no country. But very quickly, Karl Marx goes on to say that uh, you have to challenge for political power at the level of the nation state. And we believe that this remains the stakes today, that the national framing of politics is where you have to contest for political power for a number of historical reasons, but partly because this is where fundamentally democracy was won and it's where real power still rests and it where the working class continues to identify as a democratic agent in society. So contesting on the front of the national level is fundamental to politics. Now, where we think there, there may be a grain of truth in the centrist critique of populism is to say that in the breakdown of neoliberal globalization in the global north, because that has been coincident with, on the other hand, the, uh, the breakdown of the traditions of the left, the deformation of the working class in terms of trade unionism, social democracy, um, and so on, it's tended to be the case that where working class people have had grievances against neoliberal globalization, these have been often better articulated by uh, the populist right. And that's where a lot of the disruptive oppositional uh, energies released by the 2008 crisis and today by the coronavirus crisis and so on, they've often gone in the mode of the populist right in Europe and also in America. We do believe also that this the wrong approach to this is that the left should shelter behind the uh, centrist establishment of Keir Starmer in the United Kingdom, Joe Biden in the United States, and so on. Indeed, if the left's only goal is to confront the populist right, very often the best thing that we can do is to maintain our political independence and be able to articulate ourselves some of the grievances left by the breakdown of the order of neoliberal globalization. 
in all of these respects, as I said, we are sympathetic to the populist mode. Uh, we are certainly opposed to anti-populism uh, that has been a predominant mode of liberal politics recently. On the one hand, on the other hand, as uh, I think Pete is going to address, there are um, certain limitations to the populist mode of uh, rhetoric that we think should be addressed. Um, insofar as there is a, a disinterest in the social foundations of the challengers uh, to um, the established order. When uh, LeClau um, and Mouffe were initially writing, there was very much an assumption that a uh, working class that had establishment profile, that was part of a political insider, that had reformist institutions that it could uh, dominate and so on, would have to make room uh, for social movement challengers, um, feminism, environmentalism, and so on and so forth. What we've subsequently experienced over the neoliberal period has been the breakdown and the uh, disaggregation of working class traditional political forces in terms of trade unions, social democracy, and so on, everywhere, but particularly in uh, the Atlantic world that we are um, discussing. Conversely, you've seen some of these other uh, challenger forces assume positions of social power in relation to the professional managerial class, academia, the cultural, uh, the cultural elite, and so on and so forth. Um, so, as Chantal Mouffe has actually explicitly acknowledged, you're in a situation now where the problem of left populism has explicitly flipped from what it was historically, certainly in the global north, uh, where increasingly what you see is that if you look at the parties, the populist left challengers of the last period, they tend to be rooted in the lower elements of the professional managerial class that have been pushed down by the economic crisis of 2008, by public sector cuts, um, and by a range of challenges faced by capitalist economies. And one of the exciting sociological factors that we thought could lead to a revival of the left was the economic convergence of these elements of the graduate uh, professions, younger people from those elements and so on, they were pushed into the working class. And there was a thought that this would eventually lead to some sort of convergence and some sort of radical new political agency emerging. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm just gonna alert you to the fact that um, more than half of your allotted time is over, just so you know that Peter will still need to have some time. Oh, okay, right. I'm, I'm just about to conclude anyway, right? Um, so uh, what we have seen on the one hand is while there has been an economic convergence uh, since the economic crisis of 2008, um, in some respects, what you have seen also is political and cultural divergence between these types of forces, which for us, I think Pete's going to explore, is epitomized by the, uh, by the Brexit campaign in the United Kingdom um, and by the uh, failure of Corbynism to um, redress the grievances that led to people to vote to leave the uh, European Union. So I'll just conclude by uh, handing over to Pete by saying that populist tactics uh, and strategy can play a positive role in class reformation and in developing an antagonistic relationship uh, of a coalition in relation to state power. And in the post-mortem of uh, the successes and failures of recent left parties, it tends to be the case that far from the, the problem being too much anti-establishment profile, on the contrary, it's that much of these forces have ended up not knowing how to deal with incorporation and getting sucked into the logic of the uh, political establishment in their own countries. So I'm going to leave it over to Pete to uh, explore some of these issues in relation to populism in more detail, focusing specifically on the recent experiences of the Anglo-American left. Thanks, James. Um, hi, everyone. 
Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Constanza. That was an excellent and really thought-provoking presentation. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from Danielle and Paolo. Danielle was one of the international activists that came to speak at the first ever Radical Independence Conference that James and I organised after the Scottish independence referendum was announced. And I had a chance to read the first draft of Paolo's paper and his argument is excellent. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from both of you. So as James said, I'm gonna continue where he left off by drawing on a couple of case studies, mainly the experience of Corbynism in the UK and the Sanders campaign in the US. Uh, but the first thing I wanna say is that when we're talking about populism, it's important to be conceptually and analytically clear about what we're talking about. Because in mainstream debates, populism is a floating signifier. As James said, it's used to describe all manner of ills and often these would be much better described as authoritarianism nationalism or caudillismo, uh, which are all separate analytical categories. And even on the left, often when people talk about the crisis of left populism, usually what's being referred to is a crisis of actually existing left formations. And those formations might be populist, but there are also a number of other strategic logics at play that draw from different traditions. I think it's worth saying up front that in my opinion and in our opinion, the theory of left populism really only sets out to help us with one kind of problem the left faces, and that's building our side, as it were. James talked about some of the promises uh, of this earlier, but also some of the contradictions involved. And he already laid out what we are referring to as populism, which is primarily a mobilizing tactic, a kind of rhetoric that pitches some kind of powerful establishment against some kind of people, and even more importantly, the other way around. In this sense, it can be picked up and used, and it can also be dropped, or it can be used at some times and less so in others. Now, in the case of both Corbyn and Sanders, what we're gonna argue is that, in their, like, is that their failure didn't come from them being less populous. If anything, it came from them being insufficiently populous. Now, I'm gonna add a qualification right at the start. I'm not saying Corbyn or Sanders would have won if they'd been more populist, whatever that means. And on a separate note, I think we need to rethink the metrics of what successful engagement in electoral activity looks like right now. But my point is the structural impediments that both of them faced were pretty much insurmountable from the beginning, no matter what tactics they used. So with that caveat, let's start with the case of Jeremy Corbyn. Corbyn's early success was based on mobilizing anti-establishment and anti-austerity grievances. Um, he attacked the city of London. He criticized the greed of wealthy elites. He was against war and nuclear weapons. And he also spoke to the widespread grievances about democratic decline, inequality, and austerity. And critically, he was every bit as scathing about neoliberals and new labor as he was about the Tories and the Liberal Democrats. This is Corbyn at his most populist. There was a clear establishment enemy that people recognized and hated. And Corbyn was a principled outsider that had always stuck to his guns. Now, Corbyn's ability to mobilize dissent uh, and Labour's anti-austerity program meant Labour performed far better than expected in 2017 in the general election, garnering a vote share that actually beat Tony Blair's performance in 2005, even in defeat. But ultimately the success in 2017 papered over an incoherence. The Labour-left coalition had to encompass traditional Labour heartland, an activist base built out of downwardly mobile metropolitan millennials, actual left ethnic minority communities, and layers of respectable middle-class professionals represented by most Labour MPs. What united these groups in 2017 was a soft rejection of austerity and a preference for a soft over a hard Brexit. But the effect of the Brexit debate meant uniting this coalition became increasingly difficult. It led to pretty desperate rhetorical absurdities at times, like campaigning against a banker's Brexit, even though leading banks were some of the most pro-EU, as were the main ideological outlets of UK financial capitalism, like The Economist and The Financial Times. Now, in order not to, uh, to not uh, alienate the Remain Alliance, Corbyn's rhetoric increasingly became centered on old-fashioned left-right parliamentary divisions. Emphasis on party unity replaced the earlier critique of new labor being in bed with corporate interests. And this reinforced the ideological integration of Corbyn's forces behind the pro-EU leadership of the People's Vote campaign that was headed 
up by new Labour hacks like Peter Mandelson and Alistair Campbell. So while Corbyn and John MacDonald were old-fashioned Benites with a vision of popular British sovereignty and anti-imperialism, which led to a pronounced Euroscepticism, they were increasingly held ideological hostage by the establishment wing of Labour. So the Corbyn project transformed from using the language of left populism into that of a far more traditional social democratic formation. The cleavage between the establishment that included the whole political class and link them to capitalists and the mainstream media, the cleavage between them and ordinary people receded and what replaced it increasingly be began to resemble a sort of traditional politics to many people, even if that wasn't really the case. And so that's why we're arguing that the defeat of Corbynism wasn't necessarily the defeat of left populism. In many respects, Corbyn was insufficiently populist. Now, to be clear, it also demonstrates the inherent difficulties of articulating a left populist majority, especially in a party with entrenched historic ties to the establishment. Now, I'm going to move across the Atlantic now. I'm going to argue that a not entirely dissimilar process happened to the Bernie campaign as well. Initially, Sanders was able to articulate a more consistent version of left populism based on an anti-establishment class politics. In 2016, his message discipline was frankly incredible. And basically it was a hardworking, multiracial American people were suffering because of the greed of capitalists, the super rich, and the subservience of politicians in both parties to corporate interests. He didn't draw distinctions between Democrats and Republicans. In fact, he highlighted the complicity of both sides over war, trade agreements, and austerity. The early Sanders thus hit a sweet spot of being explicitly opposed to neoliberal globalization, relating to the grievances of a multi-ethnic working class, and building a coalition of younger activists explicitly committed to an anti-establishment profile. And the result was that Sanders attracted anti-establishment supporters who would never vote for Clinton, and in some cases may even prefer Donald Trump. Now, while Corbyn's election as leader forced him to manage a parliamentary bloc dominated by establishment centrists, Sanders, barely, barely being a Democrat, uh, had a lot more freedom to uh, oppose the corporate centrist mainstream. But after his run in 2016, things began to change. Um, first, his prominence meant he got more airtime, and the Trump presidency meant his anti-establishment messaging increasingly became a much narrower attack on the Republicans. And in his 2020 campaign, the focus changed even further. Uh, his campaign thought that if for him to win in a crowded field of Democratic candidates, he would have to speak to the interests of Democratic primary voters, which is actually quite a narrow, unrepresentative block. So rather than attack the Democratic establishment, the campaign focused on being the most vigorous prosecutor of Donald Trump. And that forced Sanders to leap on tropes like Russiagate and the idea of Trump as a fascist and so on. And so Sanders was thus forced into the constraints of the traditional fight between Democrats and Republicans. Suddenly, the division looks more similar to the one established over decades of neoliberal hegemony. So Sanders, much like Corbyn, Went, uh, went from looking like an anti-establishment outsider fighting for the people to the most progressive Democrat playing the parliamentary game. And so we want to argue that both Corbyn and Sanders would have been far better served to retain left populist mobilizing tactics rather than shifting to the more parliamentary approach that they ultimately did. But why do we want to argue this? Well, again, we're not saying this would have necessarily led to them winning elections, although it probably wouldn't have hurt. But the key reason for adopting left populist mobilizing tactics is because it could be a mechanism by which a left, from its currently very narrow base of support, could participate in a process of working class reformation. The concept of class formation comes from E.P. Thompson's Making of the English Working Class. An essential component of Thompson's narrative was the national popular roots of class consciousness, particularly in constitutional identities. Think of the freeborn Englishman uh, in that famous book. But as Perry Anderson's noted, class formation isn't a once-off accomplishment. Capitalist history has seen working classes made, unmade, and remade, formed, deformed, and reformed. The neoliberal era was defined more than anything by the deformation of working class institutions. And I think Paolo is going to talk a lot more about this in his presentation. Hey, just a minute. Now, just to interrupt. Sorry, you got a couple minutes. Thanks, Patrick. 
Now, the process of class reformation will need to address the lower ranks of service work in the private sector, often among occupations who have little identification with their place of work, think call centres, supermarket workers, waiters and waitresses, and so on. Now, select, uh, successfully relating to their grievances may require a national popular anti-establishment framing for the left. Now, none of the above negates requirements for a Marxist understanding of class based in relationships of exploitation and production. The point is, class struggle must adapt itself to historical circumstances and must be flex uh, flexibly adapted to local circumstances. All that being said, and I'll finish with this general point, as an anti-foundationalist theory, left populism only gets us so far. It has little to say about building left institutions or, or infrastructure. There is at best an implicit assumption uh, that with the correct articulations, the situation will be better for building socialist organizations. But that doesn't amount to too much more than the line from Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams. If, they build, if we build it, they will come. Even more importantly, left populism has no theory of the state. What do you do when you get elected? What do you do if you're able to form a government? If a state's a capitalist state that reproduces capitalism, irregardless of the personnel occupying structures, then which parts of the state apparatus need to be abolished? Which parts need to be transformed and into what? These are still some of the crucial questions the left has to work out and populist theory doesn't help with that. So we have to accept the inherent limitations here. This type of theory simply isn't designed to help us answer these questions. But if we accept the limitations, that's okay, because we can still use the best elements of left populist mobilizing tactics, knowing that other theoretical tools are going to be needed to answer these wider questions. All right, thanks to both you and James. That This is shaping up to being a really fascinating session, making me even more excited to hear our next speaker, namely Daniel Obono. Uh, Danielle is an Afro-feminist and eco-socialist activist and a deputy in the French Parliament in representation of the 17th district of Paris for the movement La France Insoumise, or Unsubmissive France. At the National Assembly, she is a member of the Laws Committee, Constitution, Liberties, Justice, Security, Territorial Collectivities and Immigration, and of the European Affairs Committee. I turn it over to you, Danielle. Hi everyone, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this conversation. It's, um, it's been already so inspiring and, and a very learning process. So I wanna to talk to you about uh, the situation in France and from the point of view of a parliamentarian and an activist from La France Insoumise. It means that I wanna focus on what we're facing uh, the Macroni, as we said, the Macron regime, and uh, how we shaped our strategy over the past three years. First of all, since uh, we are at uh, the time for New Year wishes, I want to start with um, the wishes from a nurse that was broadcast on, on uh, an internet media. Uh, they do it regularly every year now, at the same time as the uh, Macron president uh, speak to the nation in, in France. Uh, they usually invite a worker or an academic or someone, a regular person, to give um, alternative uh, nationwide uh, wishes. Um, it's, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit long, but I think it's very, it, it describe the situation in the most clearest terms uh, possible. And so please bear with me um, about this. Here's what she says. I have a heavy responsibility of representing those who have been discovered by some to be indispensable in the face of the epidemic. I'm talking about caregivers like me, a nurse in Saint-Saint-Denis, which is one of the uh, surrounding department in around Paris, but also about all the, the other workers in the shadows with or without legal documentation, Devli delivery men, garbage collectors, transporters, cashiers, cleaning women, and home helpers. I could make a list of all the filthy things seen and experienced during this crisis, but also those that have been part of our daily lives for far too long. 
it will be a long one talking about the dead, tears, injustice, tears, situation where everything is hanging by a thread, where we have even been denied the right to have limits. Tonight, you will hear the president use a whole bunch of superlatives to qualify us. He will probably say that it is thanks to the exceptional mobilization of caregiver that we are passing every milestone. In a way, that's true. I've seen my colleagues surpass themselves like never before. Yet for many of us, this will cause bitterness, even anger, because it has been done in, on our backs, our sweat, our tears, our health. There is really nothing to be proud of, especially if it's not to learn from it and to vote 2 billion euros in additional cuts uh, on public hospitals to be made in 2021. So why do we accept it? The problem is precisely that we don't really accept it anymore. Some of us, tired of fighting in a vacuum, also end up saying, let's get up and go. Right now, finding experienced nurses is like looking for a, a, an FFP2 mask last March. There aren't any. Who would blame them? A system that only holds on by the guilt is not sustainable forever. I won't forget that in Saint Saint-Denis, more people die there than anywhere else and in the most total indifference, precisely because the people most vulnerable to the disease are concentrated in those very poor living conditions and difficult access to care. There are the people who have continued to be exposed in the name of safeguarding the, an economy of which we are not even the beneficiary. Nor, we are, nor will I forget that your first reaction was to find ways to express your solidarity. But like our movement to defend the hospital, I'm sorry to have to tell you that it wasn't enough. Moreover, a small lull was enough for the other president, like so many others before him, to talk to us again about reorganization rather than lack of mean. We are coming out of this year tired and changed. We have to learn to live with our fears and doubts. But this year has also shown us that in the face of danger, that solidarity is vital, that in the face of injustice and lies, we cannot afford to remain silent. So for 2021, I wish us to live these moments when we raise our heads and feel the strength of collective energy to succeed in protecting each other because our lives are worth it. Above all, I wish us joy, laughter, love and health. I wanted to share with you those wishes uh, by Yasmina Ketal, who is a nurse, but not just anyone. She's the member of the collective, collective interurgence, and she's been involved in one of the most long lasting social movements over the past years in France. It was a, a movement uh, led by nurses and caregiver and health workers that have been fighting for a year through demonstration, actions, um, different type of collective actions in order uh, to, to, to show the society and the government the need to, uh, to fund uh, the, the, the social services and especially uh, hospital. And now with the eruption of the COVID-19 crisis, they have been shown to be the vanguard, actually, of, of the working class, the vanguard of, of, the, of the people. So uh, for me, what uh, Yasmina Ketel just said in those uh, New Year's uh, wishes to the people um, is it encompasses the, the very dynamic that has been uh, building in France over the past years and especially uh, even more since the COVID-19 crisis. And it's part of the reason why uh, the power now, uh, the Macron's power, which I want to focus more uh, right now, is so, more, uh, so, so weak right now, not, to, not just because of the crisis, but also because of, of, of that movement, of what uh, Yasmina Ketal said, that we cannot be silent anymore. So now let's talk a little bit about Macron. 
let's talk about uh, the Macroni, which is the regime, uh, France's own brand uh, of neoliberal authoritarianism. I think it's important also because previous speaker talked about um, left populism and populism uh, and how we define ourselves. But I think it's also important to understand what we are uh, facing and what we are fighting uh, against. And in France, it's very interesting because uh, Macron is, um, is a former member of the Socialist Party, uh, the so-called left or social democrat left, or let's say social liberal left, actually. And uh, he was elected in 2017 uh, with the promise, uh, the promise to uh, bring together people from the left and from the right and to get all the best ideas uh, from, um, from those both sides. And he, and, and, and he was a member of the, of the, the previous government and he just, uh, he just uh, came out from within and, and take over take over the, the power. But what is very interesting is how uh, throughout the past three years, he emerged to be this uh, neoliberal uh, authoritarianist um, uh, government, uh, which is uh, pandering to the far right and clearly pandering to the far right. And that's precisely what we have to defeat in, 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 in two years in France and, um, and also I think it's interesting to uh, analyze the, the process of, uh, of this uh, uh, evolution of social liberal and social, demo social democracy because it's, it's directly linked to, to the Macron is directly linked to, to, to social uh, democracy. So what do we have? We have um, neoliberalism that has been wreaking havoc on on, on, on the country for the past uh, 20, 30 years. And uh, the case of healthcare, what uh, Yasmina Ketal, the nurses, uh, I told you before, was, was talking about. We're talking about a, a country which in 2000 was um, branded of having one of the best uh, healthcare system in, in the world by the World Health Organization. But now we are struggling uh, in the face of COVID-19, but way before the crisis, our healthcare system was uh, struggling because of the policies uh, of the, of the neoliberal, so-called neoliberal left uh, policies that of course Macron has been, has been uh, continuing uh, since his uh, power. But what is uh, quite new, because this is not so new, because the, the previous government, as I say, was a social, socialist party uh, government. So they had been, uh, um, they have been doing this the, pretty much the same. What is new is faced with uh, social movements, uh, the like we've never seen uh, in, in, in decades in France. Um, we'll talk more about uh, the Yellow Vest movement which is uh, one of the new example of a populist movement actually happening in France and, and, and something quite new and that we've never, uh, we have never experienced before. And you had also more traditional uh, social movement uh, against the pension reform ha ha happening as I, I was talking about the healthcare workers also on strike. So you've had, we, we've had experience uh, the past three years um, big social movements happening from all um, sides of society. When we talk about the, the Yellow Vest movement, this is a movement from people uh, not usually uh, going on demonstration uh, from not just cities and, and urban center, but the rural areas. Uh, I think it's it's been said by researcher, one of the uh, the biggest social movement in the in the story of the of the Fifth Republic, and that really shook the power and 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 was um, almost able to to topple Macron at uh, at uh, at the time uh, two two years ago. You had the most more traditional uh, trade union led movement uh, against the pension reform that had been happening, and facing all those uh, social movements the response of Macron 
has been uh, particularly brutal and uh, and this uh, repression has escalated uh, over the past uh, over the past month uh, and to the point actually where uh, friends have been more and more condemned by uh, international uh, organization from, by the UN for the use of police forces and and brutality when you think about the yellow vest movement they have been uh, thousands of people uh, unlawfully uh, arrested and, and put in jail. You got three people who died, 32 were uh, dazed, five uh, got their ends turned off. And it's an incredible level of repression that, that we've been witnessing. And in the context, in the context of, of COVID, the government has even increased this, uh, this um, repression uh, establishing a, uh, a state of emergency that gives them uh, unprecedented power. So we got this um, particularity of, of the Macroni, uh, which mm, put together neoliberalism and authoritarianism in a, in a way that was unprecedented with um, a strong uh, trend of also uh, using, as I say, pandering to the far right. And they said explicitly that they, they, they want to um, face, and Macron said explicitly that he want to face Marine Le Pen, which is um, the leader of the far right uh, uh, that was already previously at the second round of the presidential election. So they are making everything possible uh, to, to, to have their, uh, as, uh, as the main opponent and going as far as using uh, Islamophobia. And that's also one of the, uh, the main attack on the, on the working class, actually, uh, that the, the President Macron has been using to, to, to divide uh, social movements and, and, and using also uh, the state of, uh, of um, emergency uh, uh, due, to, due to the terrorist threat uh, to, to, to amp this uh, Islamophobia. So I think uh, I wanted to talk, um, to focus on Macron and to understand uh, for us as activists and also as political elected official, um, the situation in France right now means that we've, we're facing, uh, of course, health crisis, but also a very deeply institutional crisis, an economic crisis, uh, and also a crisis of the state. Uh, which has been um, weakened by decades of neoliberal uh, policies. So this is a, a, a very uh, unstable cocktail uh, in this situation. So as um, left-wing people, as, as uh, political activists, um, what lessons um, from the situation now, but also from the past, what, what, what did we learn over uh, the, the past decade? Uh, about uh, fighting for power, about electoral politics, about how do we how do we uh, uh, build movement and get involved in in, in movement and and uh, and fight against uh, not only against the government but also fight for power. So I want to focus now on the the the, the lessons from the past and from the present, and especially um, about my experiences from the social movement uh, in, in the 2000, uh, in Italy and, and in Greece. I started to get involved in politics at, at the time of the big uh, anti-globalization movement. Uh, and and it, it's, uh, it's also important, I think, when we talk about uh, left populism, um, to remind that it's rooted in those social movements, at, at least in, in, in France. Uh, and. Um, what, what we learn from the social movement at, 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 uh, at the same time, uh, the strength of, of the social movement, for instance, in Italy, in Genoa, when you have organized the organized left, which was able to fight back against uh, Berlusconi when Carlo Giuliani was, was killed, but the same left uh, that uh, disappeared uh, after, after getting into power and after compromising in power, um, and uh, in a sense, whether you think in, uh, about Italy in those years and uh, up to Greece in, in, in 2015 and the 
and the and the referendum of Syriza, it's like this um, uh, Euro communist tradition uh, kind of said saved the euro uh, at uh, at uh, the expense of the left of communism. So when they were in power, uh, one of the things that we learned from is uh, the compromise with uh, social democracy in a position of um, minority, if you think of, uh, of, of, of Refondazione in Italy, or even in power uh, like, like Syriza, uh, when they, they try to negotiate the, with the EU without a plan B, uh, mean that they were uh, doomed to fail uh, without actually also uh, using the, 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 the movement and the social movements as uh, the, the main uh, uh, impetus for, for the uh, face-to-face with power, whether it was the, 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 the power of the state in Italy or the, U, the European power. Daniel, so forgive me, the interruption. Were, I'm sorry to interrupt. You have a couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, to me, those were a very important lessons I learned from, from those movements. So to conclude about uh, this and, and back, to, back to France and um, the situation we are facing as a, as a, a new movement in the same time, uh, La France Insoumise, and how, um, what we learned from the need to make a clean break from social democracy and, 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 and be clearly um, even uh, saying that we, we don't identify as left, as the left used to, and we, 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 we don't care about labels. Uh, that's why we've been actually labeled as populists uh, as, a, as, a, as, a derogatory, as a derogatory terms, actually. But what we said is uh, we need to unite people around the program, uh, around around uh, uh, political ideas and objectives and concrete um, government uh, measures that we want to implement. And I think that would make it possible for our movement to be one of the main uh, uh, opposition now uh, in the parliament, in uh, facing facing in Macron government, but also being part of all the social movement, especially being part of the, the supporting, being the one of the, the only uh, political movement supporting the Yellow Vest uh, protester uh, uh, over, over two years ago. Um, so um, when we talk about uh, the, the, the left populism, I think it's, it's less about um, the label than it's about the, the, the strategy and the idea that uh, we, what, we, what we are witnessing uh, right now, what we've been experiencing in France over the past years, have been in precedent uh, anger and discontent from the people. So this is the base of our strategy. Um, and, and, and also the idea that uh, all this power and the, the question and what we are still struggling with, but we'll have to, to figure out uh, in the next year because of the, the presidential election. And as I said, we are kind of the last one standing in, in Western Europe uh, after the defeat of Jeremy Corbyn and uh, over the Atlantic, the defeat of, of Bernie Sanders. We are kind of uh, the last left European uh, Western populist standing in a bit to power uh, and uh, to me, the lessons learned learn from uh, Italy, Greece, but also the UK and, and the US are very important for us now to, to, to build from the movement and the discontent, especially in this time of crisis, uh, and turn uh, all the power of the, those movements into power. So uh, I'm going to end uh, now, and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, over speaker and the question to to go further into this uh, debate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. That was fantastic. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry we couldn't give you more time, but we'll have some time during the Q and A. Um, our final speaker then is Paolo Garbaldo. Paolo is an Italian political sociologist and the director of the Center for Digital Culture at King's College in London. He holds a PhD in media and communications from Goldsmiths College. His research focuses on the transformation of politics in the digital era in the context of social movements and political parties. Paolo, take over. Hi, everyone. 
Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you. It was really great to listen to your presentations and uh, to see the different experiences that are happening at different corners of the world. Uh, I mean, I think we are in a very peculiar phase, a phase that is both uh, fearful and I think also exhilarating for, for the potential it contains. If we look at things with a little bit of historical perspective, I mean, we can see that 10 years ago, it was a very different time. It was 2011, right? The time of the so-called movements of the squares, of the occupations of public squares, where there was this strong sense of a lack of uh, a progressive political offer, right? There was a contestation embracing the entire political class precisely because of the perception that nobody was there to represent the popular classes. We now stand at a different conjuncture, a conjuncture where during the 2010s, we have seen a number of new left movements, campaigns and candidates emerging, often um, described, labeled with the umbrella term left populism. And we've seen some quite impressive achievements despite many defeats, right? I mean, I think it's important bearing in mind that while Sanders was defeated, while Corbyn ultimately was defeated, it remains very impressive that people that were stemming from the radical left uh, um, who were campaigning on explicitly socialist uh, positions managed to uh, get so close to power, right? At very short distance from achieving power, as was the case, for example, with Corbyn in 2017, uh, who really got, I mean, few thousands votes away from a possible majority in the commons. So I think for me, the question is uh, what we can learn from um, the successes of this uh, new socialist wave, of this new socialist left inflected with populist discourse. And also obviously what we can learn from the problems, from the failures of uh, this wave so that we can build into the future. And I think that really the question of the relationship between populism and socialism should be at the center of all strategic discussions for activists on the left, uh, given that in a way populism is perceived to be uh, central to contemporary reality, while on the other hand, uh, socialism uh, provides uh, a long-term vision for the future and the alternative uh, society, which we want to build. And actually, these two terms are not all that uh, um, incoherent with one another or, or uh, mutually exclusive. I mean, Ernesto Laclau himself said that socialism represented the highest form of populism and that many socialist movements in, it, in, in history, well before the 2010s, were using populist themes to uh, mobilize uh, their electorate. But I think that, I mean, without going into definitions of populism and really taking it almost kind of a face value as something that defines the spirit of contemporary politics, I think what the omnipresence of the idea of populism uh, and uh, also in the context of left campaigns can teach us is something about the paradox of, of contemporary socialism. The fact that perhaps for the first time in history, uh, perhaps uh, after the utopian socialists, let's say, of the, of the 19th century, we are witnessing a time in which socialism is popular uh, while trade unions are weak. Uh, I think this is a, a really great paradox uh, because of the fact that traditionally socialist parties relied on the presence of a strong labor movement, uh, relied on the existence of, of trade unions uh, that in a way acted as a sort of, of the muscle, the social muscle on which uh, a socially, that sustained the existence of, of socialist parties. While if we look at a contemporary uh, landscape, we see that uh, trade union density, uh, namely the uh, percentage of workers who are unionized is as an, at an historical low, uh, since uh, the Second uh, World War. Uh, I mean, a case uh, uh, that, it, that shows this very clearly is the US, where uh, the percentage of workers that were unionized was stood at 30% back in 1960 and uh, was as low as 12% in 2010. Uh, and I think it, it hasn't moved uh, much from that. Uh, it has, in fact, I think, still declined from, from there. 
um, this uh, ap these, these applies to many countries, except perhaps for Scandinavian countries or Iceland, where, where you have uh, very high levels uh, of, of unionization. And I think this really raises some interesting questions. I mean, um, what is the connection between uh, the, the growing populist element in socialist politics and the fact that there is such a weakness of trade unions? I think that there is a strong connection in the fact that we could read uh, populism as uh, an attempt to make up for the weakness of social organization by redoubling the um, element of political representation. Namely, in other words, at a time when uh, differently from the past, differently from a kind of 20th century socialism, uh, the social constituents of, of socialist parties, uh, the unions, the various labor associations, and so on and so forth, that traditionally constituted a sort of the pillars on which socialist parties stood are, are very weak. It is as if it is necessary to redouble uh, the element of political representation, to construct a sense of unity in the political sphere, which is lacking in the context of the social sphere. And it is in this sense that we can understand the plebiscitary element of populism, the importance of leadership, the importance of candidates such as Bernie Sanders, such as Jean-Luc Mélenchon, such as Jeremy Corbyn, Pablo Iglesias, Ada Colau, and many others uh, as sorts of uh, points of condensation for uh, many uh, people, for people who are nonetheless mostly uh, starting off as individuals rather than people that are organized uh, uh, and structured in, in uh, uh, movements that provide these people social representation. So this is the first, basically this is the main thesis I, I'd like to put forward. I mean, populism as a sort of recuperation, as a tactic to make up for the weakness of social organization through redoubled charismatic political representation. And in my work, for example, on a digital party, uh, this has to do with the way in which digital parties construct platforms to gather together what I describe as super bases, uh, as basically masses of people that are united in their uh, joint focus, in their joint um, uh, identification with what I describe as a hyper leader, as a charismatic leader, that keeps people together uh, through by dint of his her charisma and uh, ability to represent the people who are otherwise dispersed. I mean, this sense of dispersion has to do with uh, uh, low union density, with the fact that we, in a way, uh, experience a situation similar to the one uh, described by Anna Arendt in The Origins of, of Totalitarianism, a situation of uh, uh, disorganization of the class structure, of destructuring, in a way, of the class structure, in which uh, uh, classes are extremely fragmented, if not altogether pulverized. And it has to do with a great complexity of contemporary class structure. I mean, I think that the left really needs a new class analysis, really needs to understand what is the landscape of uh, the world of work and what is the landscape of contemporary classes. One problem with the theory of populism, I think, in, in the form uh, developed by uh, Laclau and, and Chantal Mouffe, which is the most sophisticated form, is that it has somehow led, perhaps unwittingly, to the assumption that left populism does not require us to think about class because it is a sort of catch-all um, discursive and political logic where democratic popular interpolations, as they are described in an Althusserian fashion, are ultimately aimed at appealing virtually to anyone, right? where the people is really the totality of the citizenry. And in fact, I'd say that that is not true uh, as populism always contains an implicit, perhaps, uh, class element. Uh, it is not a politics uh, that appeals to the people as a whole, but it appeals to the disgruntled people. It doesn't appeal to the entirety of the citizenry, but it, it appeals to the excluded citizens, 
there is always a plebeian element in populism. There is always uh, the attempt to target a section of the people that uh, particularly identifies with the uh, all-encompassing notion of the people precisely because they feel otherwise excluded by from any other corporate uh, category. Uh, populism doesn't just appeal to the left behind, uh, it also appeals to the fallen below, to those who have fallen below because of decline, because of declassement, uh, both in, in the middle class and in the working class. And in fact, if we are trying to make sense of contemporary class structure, we can say that there are two people that are appealed uh, to by the left and the right. The people that uh, right-wing populists mostly are, are trying to, to mobilize comprises what we could describe as the old working class that these days is mostly uh, located in peripheral areas due to the ruralization of manufacturing, due to the process in which uh, factory plants have progressively moved out of the urban centers and out into provincial areas, and the old uh, middle class or the commercial middle class, um, what Thomas Piketty describes as the merchant right. Uh, these are both classes within which uh, there are many people who are disgruntled because they are facing, unlike the many other people in society, a, a prospect of declining uh, living conditions, declining income, and the declining prospects for their children. On the other hand, the left appeals to a people that is more identified with, with the service sector, both the highly qualified and low qualified jobs in the service sectors. Uh, it appeals on the one hand to um, the so called new middle class that has been a very strong um, electoral structural support for, for the new left, uh, comprising so called sociocultural professionals, as I guess most people in this room are. are. And on the other hand, uh, the service working class, the so-called new working class or service precariat, uh, which is these days, uh, I mean, which comprises, I mean, it's quite obvious, I think, uh, um, the examples of this category, but let's just say to make it clear, I mean, delivery workers, uh, um, cleaners, uh, care workers, nurses, uh, so-called pink collar workers, uh, which in this day and age are the most subaltern class of all even more subaltern than manufacturing uh, workers that have uh, um, swung uh, more to the right. So uh, amid this situation, I think uh, the question is really how we can construct organizational structures uh, to give more steadiness, uh, more solidity, ultimately more capacity and more capillarity uh, to socialist organizing uh, in order to make sure that uh, our mobilizations and campaigns don't become something that has a lot of enthusiasm at, at the starting point, which then, in a way, uh, elapses and, and leads to the opposite of euphoria, namely dysphoria or depression. So one uh, element, one solution to that is obviously that we need new forms of social organization that at the moment are lacking. We need a rebalancing towards social organization. And in this sense, there are some good news uh, coming from uh, opinion polls. Uh, for example, in the US, an interesting uh, poll from uh, Gallup uh, registered recently that, um, if I remember correctly, 68% of US citizens view trade unions favorably up from 50% 10 years ago. That means that in recent years, unions are becoming more and more popular. Uh, we also know from other union polls, uh, from, from other opinion polls, sorry, that also socialism and government intervention is becoming more popular. So this opens, I think, an important opportunity for the construction of new organizational structure and for an uh, unionization and organization drive that is really necessary to achieve more capillarity, especially outside urban areas, that as we've seen also in the last election in the US, uh, are uh, very safe strongholds for the left, but the left cannot do just with urban centers. The, the left also need to contend uh, provincial constituencies, 
uh, non-urban constituencies if he wants to defeat uh, the right. Uh, also, obviously, the question of party organization will remain something very important to give more solidity uh, to socialist organizing and to overcome, I think, some excesses, some problems of the populist moment. Uh, namely, much of uh, uh, the populist logic has to do with a suspicion of intermediate, intermediary structures, a suspicion of bureaucracy that harks back actually to Rousseau uh, the Jacobin and uh, uh, the Loi Chevalier of the French Revolution, which prohibited the creation of, of corporate bodies of intermediary organizations. But creating uh, cadres or cadres, whatever your favorite uh, pronunciation, uh, is, I think, once again, a fundamental task uh, uh, for a socialist left uh, that is able to combine, I'd say, to, to conclude both the war of movement that is proper to populism, the ability to uh, create enthusiasm and mobilize people very rapidly in a very short time around elections, and, and the war of position that is proper thing to socialist organizing and, and to labor movements, namely, namely the ability to set roots, to move for, from what today looks very much like a rootless socialism uh, which is constantly in flux uh, to a socialism that actually is able uh, to construct strong goal, strongholds in local areas and give representation, uh, not just to the service working class and to the new middle class, but also to the old working class uh, that has increasingly shifted to the right. Thanks very much. Ah, uh, well, thank you, Paolo. Um, all right, well, where, where we're at at this point is that we have, we're at eight minutes past the hour. We are scheduled to go to th half past the hour, but we're going to a lot, at least five extra minutes uh, because we've got to start it a little late and we've gone a little over time um, in terms of our originally planned schedule for this. So what I would like to do at this point is to encourage particularly those people who um, are uh, panelists or speakers throughout the conference um, to think about questions, or maybe hopefully you've already done that, um, to uh, advance some questions or comments to our panelists, really stimulating set of presentations. So are there any of you who would like to do that? Um, just indicate to me by activating your camera and then just sort of signaling me with your hand and I'll call on you. For the rest of you, who don't have that access to your cameras, um, just put a, submit a question to the Q&A, which is the, um, in the control panel at the bottom of your screen. Anybody in particular wanna go first among our panelists? Uh, Eric Palomares, why don't you go ahead? Hola, buenas noches. Voy a permitirme la, el privilegio de Hi, hablar en español, que muy pocas veces eh, es posible en este tipo de conversaciones. Eh, me, me gustaría referirme a lo último que like se ha comentado eh, en relación a los sindicatos, porque se ha estado hablando bastante durante We've los últimos eh, días en, en, over the past few y days about lo que se sugiere, ¿no? eh, como como la necesidad de recuperar los sindicatos y ahora con el populismo, si fuera el populismo una especie de, eh, como, como si fueran dos cosas diferentes, eh, que es lo, 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 lo último que, que se ha dicho por Paolo. Me gustaría hacer una aclaración porque creo que a veces no se, no, no, no se reflexiona like suficiente sobre ello. Y es que... Eh, eh, and it's Para the following. Tener un sindicato, hay que tener un to have que te a sindicato. union, es you decir, must have no es work that allows una you to have a union. De los it's not ¿no? just a eh, deficiency no of trade unions that aren't able to clases, represent que, the working eh, class. Los últimos años hemos, but eh, rather that eh, hemos over the past un few years, we've had a change in the structure of the economy para, para, that has made it so difficult ¿no? to even find work that would allow you a union. Eh, I live eh, in Denmark, and the numbers here, the statistics about trade unions, 
are eh, because they are así, public sector así, workers. Esto no and even then, que, eh, que, it does not que, mean que se puede hacer una alianza that sencilla, there is a simple conclusion to make una about trade unionism. De un mes a otro a For example, there have es, been no firings Europa, of eso, eso uh, 100 professors. I don't know any other un European uni uh, university where that has happened. And here we didn't have any defense response to that Entonces, mass firing. Por un lado, and here they are public sector workers. So, all trade unions, Por it isn't lado, that all trade unions are favorable la, digamos, to uh, permite, a militant transformation, ejemplo, but the neoliberal economy doesn't necessarily America allow Latina, it. Que, digamos, In masa, Latin America, eh, la sobre where people have talked claro, about populism, half of the economy that is half of the population that is economically active is in the informal sector. They no are informal de, sector de workers. Con, it is impossible ¿no? to make Entonces, a eh, link eh, to the unions. Eh, me parece que, que la so I think that hypo the populist hypothesis es que that we have discussed hoy is interesting because es muy difícil. No hay, no hay recuperating las unions que structurally de is extremely prosaica. difficult no in a more prosaic no form or in other words. Eh, there are y no la hipótesis jobs. populista permitía precisamente, and y esa era la idea en términos de lo que Ernesto le, ¿no? planteaba como su uh, ontología de la política, la posibilidad de la representación, eh, era cómo podemos organizar a las personas the question is, how can we organize ¿no? people to participate es, es, in politics? Por ahí, ¿no? Creo que la, I think la, that la, is the central question. That is, it's, that is populism's Evo, contribution o, o Chavez, to struggles. O, o Evo Rafael and Chávez and Rafael Correa made it possible formal, for people in the informal sector to participate in a political a project ¿no? despite the impossibility eh, of unions. Aquí, perdón, si me he mm -hmm. So I'm pero, sorry, pero I've, que, I've gone over time. ¿no? But ese brinco que necesitamos dar en relación a los sindicatos, ¿no? esa necesidad de pensar qué hacemos cuando la economía no nos da ni siquiera para tener what sindicatos, incluso los que hay pues ni siquiera están de nuestro lado, ¿no? eh, espero que esto sea interesante y, y, y me despido. Un saludo a todos. Quito la cámara. Gracias. Thank you so much. I'll turn off All my right, camera you, because I'm in the kitchen. Um, does anybody want to respond to that, or is there a an, another question that we or comment that we might uh, solicit right now, and then people can chew on both of those? Uh, Hillary, and I'm going to say that it, try to keep your. And this is not targeted at anybody in particular, but okay, I've got several people, and so what I want to make sure is that everybody gets included. So try to keep your comments or questions as short as possible. Yeah, Thank sorry, you. no, I, I do sometimes go on a bit. Um, so my, it, there were really good uh, contributions and Paolo's sort of brought them together in some ways. Um, and so I wanted to pick up on his point about how far populism is like, um, um, it, it sort of, crisp, it, it condenses um, the different demands and, and, and needs of, of, of working class people in the absence or in the face of the weakness of the trade union movement. Um, and wonder whether, um, I mean, that kind of implies that a populist leader is not only a signifier uh, in, in the way that Ernesto talks about it, but is also, um, La Clara, you know, is, is also almost like um, a substitute for, for that self-organization. And I'm wondering whether there could be conditions under which um, a leader um, is not so much a substitute, but is also themselves a stimulus to self-organization. I mean, in some ways, that was a potentiality in Corbyn because he, he, his, he was, his charisma, in a sense, wasn't of a kind that sucked people towards him and away from their own self-activity. I mean, his own... Um, personal rhetoric as distinct from the sort of narrative of the campaign was very much to say, look, you know, we're not going to do it. You've got to do it. You've got to organize. So could could you, you know, in a way, could populism be not simply about 
a narrative and about communication, but also be about forms of organization. I mean, it relates a bit to Eric's point, but could it help, could it stimulate, could it be a means of stimulating popular organization? I mean, that was possible in the, in the experience of momentum. It was, it was a, an option, maybe two in the case of Bernie Sanders, I don't know enough about the movement there, but and in, in, in Podemos, I mean, Podemos, they closed down the circles, whereas they could have developed the circles. So is there, aren't there choices that can be made within a sort of populist framework? It doesn't need to be just about communications. It can also be about material organization. I see that Danielle, Danielle Obono, that is, um, you had uh, your hand up. Did you want to weigh in? Yeah, thank you. It's I, I want I just wanted to reply to a question that was um, posted, uh, if I may, about the the abandoning the lab left and um, the the strategic advantages of of doing that. I think um, it's it's Juliana Sham who asked this. Um, and I think it's 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 very important. I focused about telling the story of Macron uh, and Macron's right to power and the way it morphed into this neoliberal authoritarian. Uh, and um, and it's very important uh, to remind that is linked to the left. He was part of the social uh, socialist party government. Um, and and even before uh, 2017, during the campaign, the 2017 campaign, presidential campaign, it was very important to distance from the socialist party and the 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 what was known as the left by by not activists but by the people when we talk about people who are not in the, involved in politics they they don't make any differences between what is label populist or what is label whatever they just know left and right at least in france so for the people the um, François Hollande socialist party government was the left and and they they put in place uh, neoliberal policies and 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 add started the repression of social movements. So that's the reason why uh, we, we, we said that it, we are not just, we're not the left, we are just, you know, La France Insoumise, and we kind of embraced populism in that sense, even if we never uh, said we are the populist left or something like that. We just said we are La France Insoumise, and if you agree with our, our ideas, uh, then you can join, and you can join freely, and you don't have to have a, 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 a CAD, a, you don't have to be a card carrying member and 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 we use the internet and um and and the, the internet platform so that's that's why it's important to make a break from that because of the left label has been has been um uh, in a sense uh, it's it's it became toxic because people attached it to neoliberalism and social liberalism and and and, and rep repression of social movement um so i think that's why we even if we said that we we are from the left we are just you know uh communist or or, or socialists or, or or whatever what we are coming together for is not to rebrand the left but to unify the people and that's how we i mean we can describe us as, as, as populist in that sense because we focus on the people that need to be to come together so um I think that was the, uh, why it was so important, and what we learned from the Yellow Vest movement also um, um, also comforted this idea of people just like having enough of the labels and the left and whatever, and just wanting to to have their demands met by the political power. So that way, I wanted to to add in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, Constanza. Uh, is going to respond to a couple of questions that she received in the Q&A. Sí, eh, yes, de, I de received Jesus some Ferrer questions from la pregunta Jesus compartida con, con Daniel, que and Daniel ha una buena a question parte. that Daniel Jesus just answered a lo very well. Que la de Juliana, si es and I also have a question from derecha. Juliana, which is, no is it useful to abandon leftist and right-wing labels? I don't know. Here, los we haven't really identified with left or right. Y cualquier 
clasificación política Whatever que ponga lo de un lado y las oligarquías del otro uh, we talk about ayuda a resolver the masses on one side and the oligarchy on the other side Entonces, and that sort of clarifies eh, any confusion about identification I think that distinto, in each place, each place hecho, is going to have its unique experience. And even populism uses this distinction of the people on one side and the oligarchy on the other side. And it is effective. It's effective because our demands are made clear. When we talk about populism, I think we have to make an out of criticism, a self-criticism of what is a politics of, of classes and how is it different from a popular politics or a populist politics. For example, informalization in Latin America, as was mentioned, is over 50%. In countries like Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina has a more robust trade union struggle. But even there, the, the topic or the issue of political and social representation has to go beyond trade unions. In Uruguay, we go beyond left and right, same in Brazil. In Argentina, not so much. But when we talk about populism, or the reason we use populism is partly because of peronism. We que se comportaban como masa We como saw peces. that um, the masses sometimes Pero, behaved as such and not as classes. So we also años, see a bad side to populism, especially in past years. Um, a side that possibly weakened democratic structures and depended on demagogy, etcétera. elitism. No todo es bueno. So it's not all good in the experience of the original experiences of Latin American populism. And the old populisms are actually fighting with, for example, the communist parties. The old parties were co-opted by Vargas si and others. So if we want to use the term populism, we have to revise it carefully because de populism Pero in the past yes, amplified de vista, some rights, but it left a lot to desire democracia. for social construction eh, and hecho, for left eh, causes. Yo creo que, que la CLO el I also para la think that la CLO Yes, we've been to Cape populism. I have some discrepancies with him, but I think it's, it's useful. Um, and it has to do with the Yellow Vest movement. How do we construct a rhetoric that creates polarization? Them versus us, the people versus oligarchy. And that has concrete demands for housing, for labor, for feminists, etc. How do we create that? De la política, porque ahí hay algo interesante que dijo, our political struggles. Lo podemos armar desde Paolo la política. Mentioned this. Sí, pero la política tiene Can que ser para this from la politics. Y yes, no but politics has to strengthen esto the social base, not just co-opt it. And that has eh, been no one es of the plates of eh, Jesús, populism. Eh, Janela, el it's de la derecha. Pero it's not necessary to abandon left or política. right. But I do think we have to simplify no political life between those who Jesús, have power or are in power and those who don't. Counter-hegemonic struggles in Bolivia Sin duda, have resulted largo, in greater uh, victories. It's, it's, it's complicated. It's a long conversation that we should have. But I think populism has also rendered important victories for feminism. 50% of Latin Americans are in middle class. They are workers, but they aspire towards the middle class. So the left has to know how to talk to the middle class. Otherwise, they become reactionary and conservative, uh, especially whenever they see the threat of of a change that could Thank you, lower their quality of life. Do I have uh, anybody else who wants to speak at this point? Maybe one of our other panelists from today, Pete or James or Paolo, respond to some um, of the, what we've heard. James? Just, uh, I saw a question about the culture war. 
um, yes. in the in in the comments. I guess, like um, in terms of the right wing populism and the culture war, it's pretty self explanatory. We don't really need to go into uh, you know Donald Trump, Brexit, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the relationship between the left and populism, I think, uh, the left and the culture war is um, slightly more complex. Like, I mean, on the one hand, what I would say is like often the culture war dynamics have been part of an attack um, on the populist left or on different left currents. So, for instance, you'll see that Bernie Sanders was attacked by Elizabeth Warren. Um, on the basis that he was supposedly a misogynist. Um, he had a number of critiques on the basis that he wasn't properly relating to other identity fragments properly and so on. Similar critiques have been levelled at Jeremy Corbyn. Um, so when he first came in as Labour leader, the main accusation was that he was misogynistic because he didn't have enough women in his uh, shadow cabinet. Um, Recently, as you're probably all aware, Jeremy Corbyn has been effectively semi-expelled from the Labour Party for periods on the basis of accusations of anti-Semitism, largely due to his history of campaigning for the Palestinians. Uh, so a lot of the discourse, discursive strategies of the culture war, seemingly from the left, have actually been used to attack the leaders of the populist left um, generally by elements of the old centre ground of politics. What I would say as well probably is that um, uh, for many people who have joined the populist left currents, certainly I'm talking largely about Anglo-America um, here, in some ways culture war dynamics have been used as a gateway drug uh, back into the centre ground of politics and to legitimise um, Bidenism, uh, Kamala Harris, um, Starmer, and so on and so forth. So um, it's got a very different relationship, I would argue, to the populist left, um, and a difficult one at times than it does to the kind of straight up relationship that it has with the populist right. Thanks, James. Um, does anybody else wanna when Pete does, Pete, go ahead. Let's just come back on a couple of the points that Hillary raised, because I think it's really fundamental and central to the question. And I suppose I come back to um, the initial point I made, which is that when we're talking about left populist parties, they're not just left populist parties. Uh, left populism is one tactic which they can adopt. And if we think about the theoretical structure of left, left populism, particularly in its Laclauian form, it doesn't necessarily have much to say about uh, using that rhetoric to build political organization. Because the point you made is absolutely correct. Can we use these vehicles in some ways to increase the strength, combativity, and so on, of working class institutions, forces, and so on, however they're organized? That's the key goal. I mean, I think that is the fundamental goal and strategy that all these formations have to engage in. The one issue is that because the like, theoretical structure of left populism is fundamentally about discourse. It's fundamentally about finding the correct articulations. There's not much within the theory that tells you about how that works in terms of actually building those political organizations. And that's where I think we need to bring in other theoretical tr traditions to complement it. And just one final thing, I think this plays out because you raised the example of Podemos. And I think that's a really crucial one because you talk about the fact that you have this multiplicity of circles, but ultimately many of them get shut down. And it just gets to this tension, which is that in terms of the leadership of Podemos, they were absolutely fundamentally interested in getting the correct articulation that could launch them from where they were into being the majority party and so on. And then they, therefore they saw that too much democracy from the bottom up got in the way of that because ultimately you then wouldn't have message discipline. You would have lots of different articulations being put forward by different groups. And so their, their strategy then was, okay, we need to shut down elements of the grassroots democracy within Podemos so that the leadership group can do that. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm not casting any sort of like judgment here either way. I suppose what I'm saying is, I think that when you take the uh, sort of theoretical discursive level of theory of populism, there is this sort of inherent, actually ultimately top down logic that can play out sometimes. Um, so I just want to 
to take the thumbs up. Thanks, Pete. Um, you got a thumbs up from Hillary. Uh, <laughs> So Gabriel Hetland has a question or a comment. Go ahead, Gabriel. Yeah, thanks. I wanted to just um, ask everyone, but it's sort of directed mostly at James and Pete explicitly, if there's something about left populism that's to, you know, just put it bluntly, better than democratic socialism. So is there, you know, why can't we just say we should be better socialists? You know, we should be more confrontational. We should, um, you know, organize a multi-class coalition because you have to do that to get to socialism? Or is there in fact something about the ambiguity, the vagueness of populism that's more successful politically and therefore necessary in this particular moment or maybe, you know, theoretically, politically in some other way better? So I wanna just sort of, you know, push everyone to think, is there actually something about less left populism that we need as uh, socialists or, you know, do we just need to sort of sharpen our socialist tools? I mean, I, I guess I'll, I'll try and be very quick so we can save space for discussion, but I guess like what you have to answer um, or, or the question that we take seriously is how do you articulate a majoritarian uh, coalition uh, in the present circumstances? Can you do that around the question of democratic socialism or can you not? Now, to me, that is an open and empirical question. But for me also, the uh, contest of political power is always at any particular moment about how do you fight for that majority, like in the, your current circumstances that you find yourself in. And in relation to that, I think that the populist um, mode, while I've been very critical of it, it does in some ways ask the right type of questions. How do we uh, get from uh, the left or the working class as it happens to be to the uh, majority in society? And how do we contest the uh, legitimation of the ruling class in the current circumstances that we find ourselves in? These, I think, are the uh, correct framing of the problem. Now, if we could do that around the agenda of democratic socialism, um, in some ways, I don't think we would be debating the question of populism at all. Like, I mean, I think everyone here comes from the democratic socialist uh, tradition. My partner recently described herself as a democratic Leninist, which I kind of like. Um, but uh, Leninism to me is always about the primacy of the political. And politics for me is always about the uh, attempt to, in democratic circumstances, to articulate your own majority um, and to contest the rule of the existing elites on that basis. Thanks, James. Um, we have really about a minute or so left, and I'm wondering if anybody has got a burning statement or answer or comment they'd like to make. Um, I really am not making a joke there. I'm encouraging you to do that. Um, this has really We've been not fascinating. Heard from I was just saying we haven't heard from Paolo in the That's discussion, true. so I, Paolo, I would like to invite him. You, to you've been in. called out. Yes, I mean, very quickly, I think there were some very interesting questions uh, raised uh, by, by uh, the participants. I mean, one question there is really, uh, yeah, this relationship between populism and social organization. It is true that, it, as Eric says, in Latin America, 50% of workers are in the informal economy. The case is obviously different, though, for um, countries in, in the so-called global north that now are experiencing uh, uh, this populist wave since, uh, say, the level of uh, penetration of the informal economy is not the tie yet, right, to, for that explanation to work alone. Uh, but it is evident that uh, it, there is uh, in no way a level of social organization that was present, say, in the, year, in the golden years of the welfare state or in the golden years uh, of, of social democracy. So I think what is interesting, I think, is the way in which in some countries we are seeing perhaps a new synthesis between uh, socialists and populists coming together in a sort of revival of social democracy. I mean, for example, what justice Democrats are doing within the Democratic Party, trying in a way to work within the mainstream to add a sort of populist element to the mix or what was happening in Italy, what is happening in Italy with the Conte government, right? With Democratic Party and, and Five Star Movement coming together. So I think that what is interesting, there is a part of social democracy that is trying to save its skin and has realized that they cannot go on the same way, right? 
So there, perhaps in the future, we may see a new uh, synthesis coming together, a sort of uh, social democracy 2.0 with populist elements, uh, reviving some of the uh, premises of the welfare state project and adapting them to uh, this age of fear, right? This, this age of trouble where people fundamentally want to be protected. I think that the key slogan for all left populist movement is frozen. Is that true for others? No, only Paolo. All right. Well, I'm sorry, Paolo, but um, I think your internet cut out. So what we're going to do at this point is to thank this panel. Really fabulous. I wish we had had more time to continue. Oh, Paolo is back. Um, I, do you want to finish your sentence? Because we're about to. Yeah, so yeah. Right. Yes, well, what I was saying is that the rallying uh, slogan for the populist left should be protection, as Shantam Mouf said in a recent art article, uh, because now is really the top question on the agenda. How can we protect society from the risk of social collapse and social disintegration? Thank you. All right, excellent. As I was about to say, this was really a fantastic panel. Um, I wish we had, I mean, I mean, it's been true for every one of the panels so far. More time would have been really fabulous.